Everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number 34 of Van Halen Stories. Today, my guest is guitar legend George Lynch from Dokken and Lynch Mob fame, of course, and Sweet and Lynch and all of his other projects, including his new uh, Guitars at the End of the World instrumental, right? Album that's out. There's a great video out there for you guys to check out for the promo of that. You go out to Henson, right? And it's at the, it's old AM, right? Uh, yeah, Henson Studio used to be in AM Studios, Albert Moss. Yeah, that's okay. where we did uh, hearing aid was done. There. Exactly. I was going to ask you that. That one of the first things I wanted to ask you is why was uh, Eddie Van Halen not involved in that? Uh, well, you know, there's Eddie and then there's everybody else. <laughs> right. I think he liked maintaining that mystique and that, that hierarchy. Well, there was that, you know, uh, David Lee Roth leaving a little bit later that year. So that was a bunch of stuff going on there. So maybe it was in involved. You know, he didn't want to, I don't know. Roth was stirring it up pretty bad at that point with California girls and all that, I think. So <laughs> who knows? Well, when you're at the top of the heap, uh, you know, why threaten being toppled? I see what you're by saying. Some guy from, from, uh, by some guy from Sweden when right. you don't have to. Yeah, you know what? You, I, I thought you came. You and Neil Sean had more cuts in that than well. I think maybe even you and Ingve and Neil Sean had equal cut in that, right? Pretty much. Cut as far as number of solos and that kind of thing. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> it seemed never, like it, it seemed like if there was you know time to the video that was right, but but yeah, you. Had I, a lot I of probably that. watched it twice in my whole life, and that right. hasn't been like thirty years. So yeah, it was uh, it was incredible, though, incredible though. I was thankful to be involved and, and asked to do it. It was cool, but I didn't do any prep or anything. I just kind of showed up and winged it. And uh, so I was just happy. It came out not terrible. <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome. Let me ask you about, you know, this is kind of about documenting Van Halen history. And you were one of the guys that was there in the early days. How did you first find out about Van Halen? How'd you hear about it? When did you first see them? Uh the first time I saw it, he was at Golden West Ballroom, which was not far from where I lived down the street from my house. My wife and I went. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing about the guy kind of, you know, uh, through the grapevine, other guitar players, other bands. I've seen, heard this guy, I've seen this guy. He's just unbelievable. I was like, what? Who? Couldn't even remember how to pronounce his name. You know, it was this weird foreign name. And I was like, what is he? He's like, I don't know. He's sort of like, he's like Filipino or, or fucking European or something. And he's crazy. And he's just his fucking, he's a monster. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. No, I haven't. So it was, so we saw that first show and that was probably the best I've ever seen Van Halen. And I probably, you know, I've toured with him, seen him, known him and everything my whole, you know, for a huge portion of my life. And uh, that was probably the best show I'd ever seen when they were just uh, still clubbing it, you know? They were they were weren't mammoth anymore, but they were they weren't signed yet. Oh man, they were hungry and on fire. It was vicious. Yeah, Tracy G, who's been on, was at that show. I think I think the same one you're at, and uh, he he said that you know the same thing that you have said over time that the tone and his style at that time was more preferable to him. And you've said this yourself about his tone at that point. You preferred it to his later tone. Or is that true? Or not? Well, I mean, he had very high standards, and he was always great. It was just different. But you know, the first thing is always the best thing. You know what I mean? Right. right I, I mean, with very few exceptions. You know. Right. Uh, so uh, you know, to see the force of that uh, force of nature kind of uh, experience was was like you know seeing Hendrix in in London. You know, uh, right. in the early days, it's just this paradigm shift in guitar ha happening right before your eyes it's pretty powerful right, right and the whole band listen i you know i get it and i modeled myself after that you know i always wanted to be a band guy not just a, you know not a guitar hero -y, whatever that means i just wanted to be a guy that that wrote the grooves and the, and the cool riffs and and played the solos that caught your attention when it mattered and helped form the basis and architecture for a great four piece band that was kind of what eddie did other than just obviously his amazing prowess as a, as a soloist and, and but as a composer and as a visionary and putting it all together you know uh, as a performer right he was just a whole package man it's right yeah. 
Yeah, so the, the, there's you know there's all the stories about him playing a bandmaster in the old early days, you know, and with uh, mm -hmm. and even a very act at that point, the guys from Dread Zeppelin who had been on said they were copying his rig when it was a bandmaster in a very act before the Marshals. Did, what did you see? Yeah, I actually did uh, see him in Mammoth, but that was a whole different experience. But but he was great. I mean, and his style was was completely different. Obviously, no tapping, no trim. Mm -hmm. um but I, I it was it's amazing it wasn't like uh it wasn't like it was still masterful and and something new and crazy and and its tone was fucking ridiculous so uh i think that mammoth period was really looking back that was kind of my favorite because we've all heard eddie a billion times you know what he what he's done and to mm -hmm. sort of anticipate what he's going to play, you know, and everything. But back then it was more sort of like, what the hell is this? Is this like, it's like Eddie, but with a lot more like grounded blues based stuff, but it's, it's almost hard to, it's almost impossible to describe. There's got, there's Leslie West, there's Brian May in there. There's Eric Clapton. But with this other thing that's really exciting and cool, it's very, very hard to describe. And the tone was fantastic. So you didn't miss not having all that other stuff that he became famous for. Right. Uh, it was a different Eddie that was really, really cool. And uh, would, I think if, if there was any recordings of that out there that were decent, it'd probably be very, uh, people would love to hear it. Was there, great. there is some stuff, actually. There was something released recently uh, of Mammoth that is pretty good, clean. A recording you hear that i'm sorry you hear the bad bandmaster you're not hearing a marshal in that and it's pretty cool yeah it's so cool all right all right so uh, you know everybody has to ask you this and i'll ask you too it's uh harvey mandel this this story about you going to harvey with him to see harvey mandel greg Rinoff, who i'm i'm friends with said that you had said you were leaving a rehearsal and you ran into him and then you ended up at the starwood with him is that how it worked yeah yeah uh, rehearsing over, I think it was at that time over Priscilla's or Barham. Um, it's hard to remember exactly, but anyways, but the, it was uh, we go actually. Well, uh, you know, a lot of us would go to Starwood, you know, just to see bands that we liked or just to do something after rehearsal. And uh, and uh, I don't remember the circumstances exactly, but I do remember sitting there because they have this balcony that's right above the stage. So the Starwood is like a, like a little mini mini concert club you know a big pa was overpowered and it was you know great vantage points everywhere you could be down in the pit or you could be up in the in the rafters so you know it was pretty cool to watch a band from up there and, and uh so you know i seen priest in the early days from up there and uh uh, uh who's rick derringer right right uh seen a lot of good great bands you know really close up uh, uh randy hansen uh mm -hmm. so anyways uh yeah so you know can he was whatever you know we all love can he they're cool and they're doing their bluesy thing and everything and then harvey mandel did a solo which was just kind of very pedestrian and pentatonic and kind of you know whatever mm -hmm. and but then he did this little kind of interlude with the tapping thing and uh, we both kind of looked at each other and went, whoa, that's, that's, that really stood out. And, you know, guitar players, we guitar players, you know, we play drives, everything. So it was like, I'm going to pick up on that a little bit. Right, that's right. Cool but it was very simple by today's standards, but it was very effective. And, and uh, I believe that's when he added it to his uh, bag of tricks. And I sort of did too, a little bit, but without as much uh, you know, success or precision, but <laughs> yeah, this, there's a, actually Greg sent me a, a, a newspaper clipping from the Starwood from 76 in December when uh, Harvey was on the bill and Van Halen was there the week of, we don't know if that's when you went, but that, does that sound like the right time period? Oh, you're asking the guy with no memory. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. So the Harvey Mandel thing, you know, do you like know a, about yeah. interviews like a police interrogation? Right. Right. <laughs> Weird. Like, I feel like I did something wrong. No, no. Uh, Chris Holmes, though, you know, you, you of course worked with Chris Holmes or, you know, Chris Holmes. 
Chris Holmes says the story was that that uh, um, his buddy uh, Terry Kilgore went over and took a lesson from Harvey, and that's how it got shared with Eddie through Terry. But you saw it yourself with Eddie, right? So, yeah, well, there's that too. There's the Terry connection, and that's that's sort of not real fluid in my mind with all this this histrionics here. But I used to hang out with Terry too and go up mm. to his place and and uh it's sort of i guess you would call it uh we would hang out and i would just kind of pick his brain and watch him play they weren't really i don't think they were officially guitar lessons but <laughs> right maybe, maybe they were i don't even remember what the whole thing was there was some gear involved i think it was maybe we were trading gear back and forth maybe a little bit he had the fucking tone in the hands and uh, i thought he was quite honestly better than eddie um because him and eddie were you know buds and grew up together and they kind of kind of did this thing together uh terry had ready kilowatt which was a three-piece that didn't have good songs every song was you know and they didn't have david lee roth and terry didn't look like eddie and move around he was his super sweet guy and just a big lumberjack looking dude you know with fucking chops like for days it was crazy he had all those jazz chops too and um and he had that tone that warm brown sound in spades man it was the actually i saw him before i saw van halen officially uh and when he was sporting that tone i was just like some little bar in pasadena or something with la Cunata or somewhere up there okay was, jesus christ yeah i've heard that yeah, old Dan Halen package, you know, he didn't have the whole thing. He, right. But he I, heard, had, I heard some of the, you know, maybe the tone and licks came from Terry. That's, that's, that's something I've heard many times. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's that black and white. I mean, you know, they were buds and they kind of evolved together and came up together. Yeah. And he got to grab the brass ring because he had all the other elements. And that's right. Frustrated Terry, of course, for the rest of his life. And that's why Dave picked him up uh, and right used later. him for his albums, you know. Right, I, I knew that. So, so back in the club days, do you remember the? Um, well, you have one of the Echo Plexes, right? You have one of his Echo Plexes, right? Yes. And then you have the one of the Naked Cabinets too. I do, and he and it. I, I didn't even realize that I went to open it up, uh, you know, last year, and and he he had signed it, which is pretty cool. Wow. Okay. Well, has a, a two JBLs and two. Uh, Pre roll of Celestians. So, do you think he actually used that on the recordings as they say he did, or he just used Celestians? No, no, no. He used the no. He used the JBLs with the with yeah. His, uh, yeah, you might, yeah. And you can hear you can hear in those recordings they have out from Sunset Sound. You can hear the difference between the JBL mic and the right. Well, okay. that wasn't anything that was transformational though. And I, I, I you know, that's a, a lot of this stuff with Eddie's tone is just like, well, okay, but you can buy a Variac and you can put JBLs in your cabinets and you can do all those things too and buy a 68 Plexi. <laughs> but that's not what it is. It's him because yeah, I've seen right. them and watched him plug into a brand new fucking little Fender combo and just do the same fucking thing. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it's all here, here, and here. I mean, it's, he's just a monster, you know. Right. I've seen him play when he's had tone that he can't stand and, and still great. So, right. Right. Uh, right. A lot of people, uh, actually, uh, jazz Obrecht, who was one of the writers that first interview with Eddie Van Halen told me that Eddie was a very sensitive guy. And you had mentioned this as well. in a thing I watched he, that he jazz's comment was he was almost too sensitive to be in this line of work. How, what would you say? Yeah, and I think he had to put up a front of hardness and sort of coldness and to kind of protect himself, which is kind of common, you know, with artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's what he was. I think he yearned to just have friends and be the guy in the neighborhood with his buddies who were in his band and your, your bandmates were your friends. And the thing is, he never had a social life. All he did was sit in his room when everybody was out partying. He was sitting in his room. Right. And, uh just practicing incessantly day and night, you know, smoking his cigarettes, uh, drinking his beer and freaking just going through it. Just going through it, going through it until it was just in his bones. Well, the rest of us were, were not that dedicated, you know, and it paid off for him in that respect, but then maybe 
didn't quite have the social skills other people have, you know. Right, right. For what what came, you know, with the, the fame and everything with his situation, it seemed like it overwhelmed him in a way. Yeah, it leads to some other things because you how it's, that's how you deal with it, you know. Right, right, right. So one of the things that uh, back in the day, I've, a couple of people have said back then, they you know, the bomb he had on stage with the Echoplex in it, right? Okay. Oh, it was like, no. The Univox. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Univox. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. The, the Echo Plex is on the, on the ground or this side. Yeah. yeah, the Univox. I was told that some people would copy that in different ways. Like once somebody had a mannequin and they would use it for their stand instead of a bomb. Did you see that? I never saw that. <laughs> really? Okay. Some people were saying they were like Carlos Cavazo may have had that or somebody. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me, but that sounds, that makes sense. But no, I never witnessed that. Never saw heard it. Of. We all, uh, Build on the shoulders of our predecessors is a nice way of saying we just all steal from each other and plagiarize. So, but that's so, how progress is made. So the uh, so the tiger, your tiger. Uh, did you do this before you saw the white and black, or after? Did it, did it influence you to do the tiger? I think it did. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, I think I did the tiger, the first tiger, which was green and black. Mm -hmm. I think I did that one. In 79 so whenever that was so yeah i would assume that was after i saw his guitars and thought well i need a variation on that maybe i'm just thinking what my thought process probably were well then it exploded all across the 80s scene everybody had one graphic guitar of some sort sort at the time sure polka dots i'm the yeah. polka dot guy i'm the electrical tape guy and i'm the animal stripe guy <laughs> <laughs> and you continue to make guitars with the uh, tiger but these are really the cool ones that you make with the uh where you carve them out are really interesting really cool yeah i had one here yesterday i just shipped it out actually yesterday that one you had uh i i was at a clinic at ken stanton music a couple few years back and you had that that one that uh it was like a grayish green color what was that one called what'd you call that one uh well i'm not sure i bet it could have probably most likely been the klondike that's it, yeah. The one you played all the time at the, at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful guitar. Yeah, that's a, it's just a different tiger pattern. I came up with I come up with different tiger patterns and I make templates of them. But I used to when I first started this doing this like 12, 13 years ago, I would just, you know, draw them on a piece of cardboard and cut them out with scissors. And that's my that's my template. And I would tape it to the guitar and then I would make changes depending on, you know, if it had an extra pickup or different things. Uh, to accommodate different design features. But uh, now I have templates, you know, I've sort of made it a little bit easier for myself so I don't have to sit there and right. do that every single time. Yeah. <laughs> right. So when the first album came out, Van Halen one came out, how did, what was your impression of the album in general, just after you've seen him all those times before it came out? Well, it changed the world, you know, and it really epitomized SoCal, you know, it was like kind of the flagship SoCal thing and we thought okay we're gonna the first thing is as a guitar player you know you got to try really hard not to fall into that trap of trying to just copy that you know that's that's tricky and that happened with Inga as well i think for all of us mm -hmm. we all just started playing a little faster and trying to learn our harmonic minor scales and <laughs> right really hard not to do that fall into that trap the same thing happened with eddie of course but um like for a while, I was just, I couldn't get off my whammy bar. I was just on that thing way too much. And, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, that, that first record changed everything and, and it's still a touchstone. Right. Right. I mean, it's, it's still amazing. The, the scene in LA at the time, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, you've said this, I think before that it was pretty diverse as far as the bands like Stormer and, you know, Jimmy Bates, who's, a, I hear about him all the time from people. Um, all those different bands that were fairly different. Is, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You had a lot of, you had a lot of punk bands, mm -hmm. which is great. And then you had uh, a band that I keep bringing up was uh, uh, A La Carte, right, which right. was one of my favorite bands. Uh, Three Piece. Uh, we'd be look uh, to dress and drag like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> and it sounded like ZZ Top. And they were all on heroin. <laughs> <laughs> they were fucking great. Didn't have the greatest songs, kind of like Ready Kilowatt to that extent. The songs just weren't all together. I remember they had one called No Tell Motel. That's been pretty cool, but you know, they needed needed better songs and need to work on that. But 
the sound and they're you know, they were tight and 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 Kevin the guitar player oh he was just fantastic you know but a totally different thing than Eddie it was a Les Paul Jr. through a you know the little uh, JTM forty five through a, a small uh, sixty eight uh, Marshall eight ten uh, metal handle uh, basket weave cabinet and man his tone was fucking sick dude oh god damn I still talk to him to this day occasionally and uh and just just man I wish he kept that rig <laughs> oh man that's wild those the, I hear a lot of people, oh now like most guys a lot of guys he's playing through you know some fractal fingers I'm like god damn uh, come on <laughs> So the uh, so was it really competitive? I mean, between bands, I mean, or like, there's always a t- discussion about Randy Rhodes, you and Randy Rhodes and, and Eddie Van Halen, and and how Randy and Eddie had bad blood. I, I don't, I haven't found that from the locals that talked to me about it, but no, I mean, you know, like uh, that goes back to that point I made earlier that when Eddie was such a massive presence, and it was just hard to not follow the leader and try to incorporate that into your style. It was just too powerful <laughs> right um, but eddie was i mean uh randy was to me it was i mean i loved him he was a very sweet intelligent uh person and, a, and an amazing musician a very deep guitar player you know with serious uh classical roots and and serious musical theoretical knowledge right um but he wasn't it, you know. He didn't. He didn't quite right. He wasn't. I was never impressed with him, his tone or his playing very much. I didn't really uh, respond to his to him very well. But I will say that in Ozzy, he blossomed. Yeah. You know, those two records were just fuck me. I mean, that was a whole other dimension that I still to this day could just take a deep dive and try to learn from his 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 compositional skills and. the classical influences that went into his uh, writing it was crazy and his choice of no notes just so smart and so articulate and so uh like everything had a point and it was all unexpected so he created something new and it was really important and uh but i did that that was not randy with quiet riot right at all Right, I got you. So yeah, so like that, Eddie still just kind of dominated the market at the time. Yeah, yeah. Randy's Randy didn't have the LA scene. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, wrapped around his finger like Van Halen did. Okay. Uh, because because of Quiet Riot, I think. I think yeah. Quiet Riot was very uh, it was a, kind of a limiting venue for him. Where's your, you know, your tone, man? When I was a kid, I saw Unchained the video live. That was kind of what got me going. But that tone was, you know, the the brown sound thing. But then it was when I saw you on Breaking the Chains and I heard that early Marshall sound. I was like, "There's another guy who has that tone." What was that Marshall you're using? A metal face? You said you used early metal faces then. It was, yeah. I didn't use plexis at all back then. We were all metal faces, right? But I found good ones, and you know, the the, the early metal faces up to seventy three were were essentially the same circuit a little more gain which is good um uh but i had a, a vintage um basket weave cabinet which is important a lot, of, a lot of people don't recognize how important a cabinet can be to your sound right and um you know and the right guitar and then you know of course we're, we're recording tape with analog gear right, in right. germany with old equipment and you know all the right shit in a big real room so nice and woody and warm and you know got was a good that, engineer that's finding the right mic placement and it's all good was that your so head the, was that your head that you brought across yeah, yeah yeah that was my head yeah i i actually i brought my half stack to europe with me <laughs> i don't know how i managed that but as as luggage right right you don't that's it. you do that now though with your 50 watt you you maybe take that and you bring you use house cabinets for when you come in town or what do you do yeah, I use house cabinets unless I'm somewhere within driving distance of, of uh, you know, somewhere in the southwest where I can, if we're going to, like, load a truck and bring our own gear, which I love doing that, then right. I'll bring my cabinets, which is, it does make a difference. I mean, I wish I could do that everywhere, but, um, but you know, house cabinets are fine. Yeah, you know, when I saw you last year when you came to Birmingham and you were using the two cabinets and your... Um 
your 50 watt. And I happened to be just, I mean, dude, I was so close to your rig. It was like, I was up on stage with you and that tone, man, coming out of that thing sounded just amazing. I was like, this is, you know, this is what a guitar player wants to be. They want to be right there in the room with it like that, that close. And it was, it was sounded killer. Yeah. Yeah. All you can hope for is that, um, that the rest of the signal path, you know, uh, yeah, supports that sound. Cause a lot of time, well, not a lot of times, but sometimes you have to be careful because you'll, you're like, okay, you know, you know what your rig sounds like. You love your rig, everything you stand right by, but you get out on the stage, you're like, what is that? You know? Mm-hmm. And so by the time they pump it through the monitors, they use different mics and then the monitors got horns and they're not really for guitar and, and the yeah. front of the house is weird or the room's weird. None of it sounds like what, <laughs> you know the source right right uh, which is why i loved it because i was hearing the source like from three feet away yeah <laughs> then you pulled the blanket off at the end and nearly blew my head off <laughs> oh it was back when i was doing that yeah i don't do that yeah. anymore don't do that anymore okay yeah it was, it was cool though it sounded great so one other thing i want to ask you about eddie monsters of rock you did a, you did that tour with him i saw you in 88 in memphis on that tour it was really hot that day i know that for sure and uh, Dokken was out there with Van Halen. And you had, you know, some interactions with Eddie on that tour that you talk about sometimes. And what was that like? Well, I had some gear issues and I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I was thinking, well, everybody's going to be using all these amps. I'm just going to go up there with one amp on a chair and just like <laughs> blow. And then I don't know, or something like that. I can't remember. I didn't put a lot of effort into the, the, the you know, having this massive rig. Cause I, wow, well, how am I going to compete with Van Halen, the Scorpions and Metallica? I'll just, I'll go up and be that contrarian guy. <laughs> so I came out with only one head, I think. And it, and it didn't work. Something happened to it from what I remember. Uh, and then, so anyways, Eddie was really cool and let me use his like number or whatever, not his number one or two or anything, but it was something that was good. It was, yeah. you know, it was, I'm very thankful. Um, so we got that. So we spent a good amount of time hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. We get to go usually after the, uh, the show every night we'd go to for many nights, we'd just go hang out and, and play guitar and talk. And, and that was really a pretty amazing, special kind of thing uh, to get to do. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Did you feel like you changed any from the very beginning when you saw him when he was a kid? Nah, I still, he'd just sit there and bury his head in his guitar and he'd never stop playing. That's all he was. <laughs> right. And he was really, you know, very serious about it, you know, wow. when he didn't really need to be, because that was his kind of thing that tethered him to who he was. You know, everything else was just superficial, yeah. all the trapping, you know, so. Right, right, right. That's an amazing thing about Eddie. It's a, you know, we I try to bring out his personality as much as I can through people who knew him. You know, that is sort of a way to to get you know closer to the person he was. With you know, if you didn't know him, so it's a, an, an honor to have you on, dude. I know you got to get on with your day, and um, you know, let me say again, uh, you know, you this Lynch Mob tour you're about to go out on. It, you call it the final ride. What does that mean exactly? This is it for. Lynch mob. Yeah, that means it's, that means it's the last time we're going to tour until we do the final final ride. <laughs> That's right. Kidding. No, no, we're we're. Uh, we're I'm just kidding. So yeah, you know. So I'm going to be 70 next year. I'm like, man, eh, I love what I'm doing. I love having my band together. So here's the thing. I was thinking, well, you know, Lynch mob has been this revolving door. Unfortunately, yeah, I've learned to deal with and accept, and it just is what it is. Can't change that. So. At this point, I'm like, okay, listen, this version of the band is wonderful. It really is wonderful. It's like something I can live with for the rest of the life of the band. So let's put a finite life on the band so that we end on a positive note under our own terms. That's kind of our thinking. We all discuss this. I thought, well, and then let's put it out of ways, you know, so we're going to bust our ass and work really hard 2024 or next year. And the first three months of 2025, and we're going to end our, our, uh, we're going to end it on uh, a Monsters of Rock cruise in 2025. Will be our last show, and we're booking the shit out of ourselves. We're going to stay very busy on the road uh, coming up this this coming year, and go out with uh, a bang instead of a whimper on our own terms with this lineup, which is very important to me. That 
it's uh, that we go out with a solid bookend with a great record. Uh, start with a great record, end with a great record, start with a great lineup, end with a great lineup instead of a bunch <laughs> of stragglers. You know? right, no right. offense to anybody who's been in the band, but you know what I mean? It was like, who's in the band this week? I don't know. Fuck. Right, right. You had so, said this. You had said before in, a, in an interview that kind of something that stuck with me was that you were giving advice to people who, who are younger, and you said, you know, you got to stick with it long enough to bear fruit, but you know how that you what you're saying has been very difficult to do so. Do you remember? Yeah, that? yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I'm in a unique position with with this band that uh, with Lynch Mob in that uh, it it has some notoriety and some success, but not enough to really uh, keep people committed to the project. You know, um, in other words, we don't quite work enough, we don't quite don't earn enough uh, to 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 keep people solidly keep people committed to. You know, so so Lynch Mob has really been sort of like a proving ground and a and a mill for 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 people to move on and go to bigger bands both for my crew and for my band members right. and uh and so okay well that that's okay but um and for, especially crew is pretty funny i just lost my I, who, tech who i love who uh i've had for many many years now who i very, rely on very heavily uh but i wanted better things for him and so he got picked up by ted nugent uh, for a couple of tours and he would bow out and do that. And he felt bad about it. And I go, dude, you got to do this. This is great for you. Right. Right. Made great money. Got his name out there. And then he started, then it just took off like wildfire. So now he's out. He's extremes guy. Uh, okay. He's doing things with Adrian blue and King crimson and, and uh, good for him. The world is his oyster now. And I'm very happy for him. Uh, but uh, and other guys i've had texts i've had have gone on to would have illustrious careers and i mean i mean top of the top uh uh you know the adam days and the mike mcintyres and uh uh i just confused all of them they're all the one of my guys is uh neil sean's guy angus young's guy uh uh, uh slash's guy uh guns and roses main dude uh white snakes main dude uh Kenny Law, uh, uh, Kenny, uh, uh, what am I thinking of? Kenny Wayne Shepherd? No, 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 not Kenny Wayne Shepherd. The, 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 uh, Mama said, who's that guy? He's just like, uh, uh, he's just like, he used to have the Afro and the Flying V. Oh, God. He, no, 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 go on. And, uh, <laughs> no, he's uh, incredibly famous guy. Oh, he's, well, really yeah. cool. he's got a really Really good physique. He's always like Lenny Kravitz. Ke- what? Lenny Kravitz. Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, was what did I say. Kenny Lavitz. <laughs> Lenny. Kravitz. Uh, hey, that'd be a good tribute for Lenny Kravitz. Right. Right. Okay. Lenny Kravitz. I should do that. You should do it. <laughs> I'll get an afro and a V and some hippie clothes, and I'll go out there and what? Dude, I'd make more money than I'd make in Lynch Mob if I did that. Speaking of V's, I just saw a video where you're playing on, I don't know if it was a reissue 59 V or whatever was down there in Florida with Blandini or whatever, whatever that project you do. Sometimes you sit in with those guys. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a thing we do corporates with okay. occasionally. Blandini, yeah. And that's actually a really fun, good band. And and uh, that V was the bass players. And uh, Paul Drennan, and and uh, he's played 38 Special and uh, uh, other things but he's really a great bass player great guy and uh but he's also uh, a, a, a vintage car classic car muscle car uh guy broker agent right. whatever we call right. him. yeah and he also does uh he also does uh uh, uh dabbles in uh, uh vintage instruments and he's a guitar player as well so he's got all this great stuff old strats and this and that and he has that d and uh so every time i play with him He's always trying to, because he's a really good salesman, or he thinks he is, and he's always <laughs> bringing out this crap, and he's trying to get me to play it, so I fall in love with it and buy it. And right, always, right. And that's how he works. And his prices are really high, and he's a hardball. <laughs> a shade, so. I've never bought anything, actually, from him. So. I was going to say you had that triple pickup Black Beauty, right? That You you still have that? It's right at my feet as we speak. Oh, it's, really? Okay. Yeah, that's a cool guitar. <laughs> I got it the couch. Well, thanks for spending time with me, man. I know you got you got a bill. So, uh, thanks yeah, for doing buddy. this, and uh, you know, hopefully, I'll run into you sometime. I don't know if I can make the the sixth show, but I, I, I 
I'll be there with you in spirit and I'll be out at my own gig trying to make a living. So thanks for all your inspiration and all the years that uh, I've been following you, man. You were Eddie and you were my one and two, man. And just oh, man. seriously, one and two. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very sweet of you, man. Very well, well you. You're doing a good thing here, a good service, a good public service, and, and we all appreciate it. So thank, thank you, you for an interesting you. interview. Thank you, George. You have a great uh, rest of the, your career in Lynch Mob, and I'll hopefully see you again. Okay, buddy. Thank you. Have a good day. You Bye-bye. too. Bye-bye.